welcome back to Prep Talk podcast. I'm your host Bartika Bhandari, and today we have the pleasure of introducing our Tadela alumni Rian Kumar, who has secured admission to the renowned UC Berkeley, pursuing a dual major in political science and economics. The remarkable student's journey is nothing short of inspiring, and as they've not only excelled academically but also made an incredible impact through their numerous curricular pursuits. So stay tuned if you want to know how you can build an amazing resume with standard extracurriculars. Hi, Leon. Welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here. Great. So let's get started. Congratulations on getting into UC Berkeley. How was the reaction? Thank you at first. It was an amazing reaction. My parents were super excited. I mean, it was my final application and it was the final day. I was tired because I had been rejected by a couple of my dream schools. And Berkeley was unlikely considering I had been rejected by NYU. But when I got Berkeley, I was so excited. And it was a fun day for me because everyone in my family celebrated. We had guests over. Amazing. Amazing. So, uh, you were heavily involved in modeling UN, right? And um, how did the experience shape your interest into pursuing political science and international affairs? Right. So, uh, as as I got into model UN through debating, mm-hmm. uh, model UN helped me build a political. Uh, build a basic political knowledge and uh, a knowledge in international relations right and i think that's where i found my interest doing more competitions in model un it allowed me to uh, see that i might actually have a career in political science and i can pursue that further although model un in an application uh, isn't because the most attractive because everyone does model un it's the fact that model un helped me realize that i can go into political science uh, from Model UN, um, I got the experience of being the secretary general of my school and uh, yeah, being the secretary general of my school and uh, that helped me uh, understand the leadership position and how Model UN, I can impact students. So what I did differently, because secretary general is a common position amongst different high schools, what I did differently was I created a program in Model UN for my school particularly where we invited guests to speak. Uh, and we basically use the impact from Model UN and use it outside extracurricularly. So pursuing it further, taking everything one step further. And I think this is good for anything you do, take it one step further. All right. I think you did amazing and a lot of people must have been impacted with the initiatives that you took. Yeah. All right. So uh, could you discuss any notable achievements or memorable moments that you had during your time participating in MUN? Yeah, I had a lot of fun being part of the MUN executive board of basically seeing students speak when you had spoken in their place years before. Uh, basically, uh, what model UN ninth graders when you look up to seniors and you see that you want to be good orators or you want to be like them and have the thought process of debating at such a high level. Uh, model UN also helps you realize that in uh, becoming one of the juniors, helping impact students' lives. Uh, in the sense that helping them realize that political science and international relations and whatever model UN does teach you is important and is a skill which is uh, which governs the basic principles of our society. Uh, it was uh, exciting. So like as secretary general, I used to go across many hall rooms and see students debating, speaking uh, and uh, arguing amongst themselves and it just made me happy. Oh, yeah. Okay. How do you think your involvement in MUN prepared you for studying political science? Okay, so uh, MUN is global politics, right? Mm-hmm. How countries debate uh, at an international level. So uh, a big part of MUN is your research aspect of that uh, part. And when I research through different uh, fields such as uh, international relations, where I research particular countries' laws and politics. Uh, when I came across the US, uh, the US political system really attracted me. And that's where in ninth grade, I took the AP US government and politics to understand the culture and the, to understand the articles in the system, the, the system the US system is governed on. And um, I think that's where uh, it helped me uh, understand that democracy is something which attracts me. The idea of having power and understanding how power can be regulated through political aspects such as checks and balances or how there are three legislative, uh, there are legislature, there is executive and there is judiciary and how it balances out society really uh, helped me uh, 
understand that I want to go into political science. I want to study law and study it further. Interesting. So you initiated a conference as well to educate people about different religions in India, and it was massive to some extent. And during the time it was going on, it was very crucial to educate people about the re- religions that are there in India. Right. So, what motivated you to take this initiative, and what impact did you have on the community as a whole? Right. So, my journey with a religion has been an interesting one because ever since I was a child, I wasn't. My parents didn't uh, confine me to one religion, which is I was born into a Hindu family, though I was allowed to practice everything. Mm-hmm. So, I did pick up Islam. I did pick up Christianity at a younger age to just understand it. I used to go to churches. I used to go to mosques just to see what the religion is about. Mm-hmm. And when I picked up Buddhism uh, in uh, I think the seventh grade. uh it really helped me uh focus myself in school and academically and i realized that I- buddhism islam and uh judaism or hinduism are based on the same uh policies and that's where i thought interfaith harmony is very important in our society mm-hmm. although i didn't plan out my extracurricular to build a conference i knew that interfaith harmony is something i wanted to work towards so basically i looked for solutions that to build an interfaith harmony system where the government is lacking a uh, delhi had a lot of riots the babri masjid riots there uh, religion has been a conflicted topic in our country and considering we are a secular state which is mainly hindutva majority it's been a touchy topic ever since the modi government came in so um i wanted to give suggestions to the government which are not attacking the government but more on the track that where they could uh, apply it further and help the political system so that's where i invited five religious leaders leaders such as the uh, head of hinduism in india which is uh, the is uh, iskon head of india uh, also invited buddhist leaders also invited a uh, muslim leaders to come talk at a conference and see that what um, interfaith harmony really is and you would expect them to fight right because you're saying one religion is better than the other but that's not what happens you see similarities come not differences mm-hmm. and uh, but considering the fact that i'm a political science student and i want this applied i didn't want to have a philosophical discussion on what religion offers that's where i invited professors from ashoka from jindal top institutions in india and also uh, economic uh, pol- politic uh, political heads uh, and also or researchers who can who actually analyze policy for a uh, for a change so you, i used them uh, to analyze whatever the religious leaders had said to create a policy memo which went to the prime minister's office so basically we worked on so the conference and what the impact on students we had we had students from 10 different schools over 150 students come to the conference and learned that interfaith harmony can be a, a particular track and we Use the learnings from that conference, or to send to the prime minister's office to uh, basically help a pol- secular policy in India. All right, all right, that's a lot, and uh, to you know have so many leaders of different uh, religions at one place, and to execute that must have taken a lot of time and you know energy and thought into just making it happen. So. Uh, how was it was the pro, what was the process of creating the entire event and making it happen and making sure that you know students are getting educated with that how did you make it possible at such a young age yeah first i think we built credibility so my initiative bodhi trail we uh, used to do interfaith uh, seva at different uh, mosques or uh, gurdwaras where we used to give our service for the day of uh, every weekend and we used to help out and we used to help out in ngos uh, educating them on religion and interfaith harmony once we had built that credibility across different uh, ngos different gurdwaras we knew that we now had a platform where we can use we can reach out to people who actually are experts in the field so reaching out to religious leaders was a task at first firstly uh, i i am a speaker for the dalai lama i worked at the tibet house and i am a speaker for the dalai lama so uh i reached out to uh, the tibet house to have one of the speakers from that conference come in uh my parents helped me with getting the hindu leader because of their connections in the uh, religion and i had to write out a lot of cold mails to people who actually 
uh, who actually follow this religion are and are recognized by the public in the particular fields. So once we had got the religious leaders, uh, the process was easier. Building the panel, reaching, writing cold mails to professors. I mean, I've written cold mails to professors in every Indian institute because we wanted to have the specific to India. We wanted Indian professors. Uh, we also had a politician come in who works for the BJP, uh, and. Um, also, uh, then uh, the main part of the conference working with my team, I had a team of five students, uh, students from uh, across schools uh, and around the same age category, uh, help me with uh, finding student, uh, writing cold mails to principals of the uh, principals of different schools in Delhi and Gurgaon, getting them to come to the conference. I mean, it, it was uh, it was a task, but we were able to accomplish it. And we hosted the conference at the Indian Habitat Center, which is a big space because it's where most cultural discussions had. Uh, and we also had the UNESCO director come in after he had heard of our conference through our social media. So, I mean, it was a success just because of how people were agitated by the fact that they're, they're, nobody's actually talking about it. Nobody has people coming together and talking about it. And that's what I wanted to do is get people together and talk about it at a space, at a space space with, with children around who can actually propagate it. Because, uh, I mean, it's you can talk about uh, religion, but it's the children who are going to stay shape the policy for the future. So having them impacted by the conference was also... That, that's something amazing you did. I think it would have impacted a lot of people. So, okay, moving on to our next question, uh, that building an impressive resume is a very difficult task and to do that at such a young age and to do that in so many areas, right? It's inspiring to a level. So what activities uh, aside from academics were involved in your student resume that, you know, uh, made an impact on the Berkeley admission offices or for that matter, any acceptances that you had? All right. So uh, I had started off my extracurriculars pretty soon, but uh, like my parents used to always tell me to explore everything. So that's what my starting goal was. In the sixth grade, I had started off exploring different fields. And I hadn't reached the decision of political science. I just wanted to be experienced in every field. So I took up coding at the start and coding in Python. And I also took up uh, in, uh, drone flying. So uh, the varied interest, taking varied interest and then streamlining it into one was a big part of my profile and how colleges saw it. So um, as you know, my religion journey and my journey with how religion impacted political science i had written uh, written a research paper on that so i think uh what you do academically uh is one thing but using that academic out of class and using them uh using uh, that uh, to expand your interest so for if i take political science if i had interest in international relations and politics i did illegal internships with vidhi which is a legal firm which uh which analyzes policies for the government and also but i also didn't want to streamline it to one particular thing so i also interned at ai companies to learn about tech uh and um varied interests i think varied interest was the thing which got my profile which put such a uh, which put my profile on track for getting into uc berkeley because the ucs have 20 activities and you need to show them that you're actually very community driven you're actually very uh, you want to make an impact on your community, but you're also pursuing your interest. So, like, I did have football on my profile. I did play on the school team. I That was also part of my profile. But also, I showed that I'm an academic student. Mm -hmm. So, showing both of them and across the 20 activities was a big part of my profile. All right. That must have been very impressive for the UC Berkeley admissions officers to see as well that you have filled out all the 20 fields where only 15 are necessary. So, that's great. Okay, so could you discuss any strategies or tips that employed uh, that you employed uh, in sort of balancing out your uh, academics and extracurriculars? Because your extracurriculars are very heavy. And yeah. how did you manage uh, your academics into that and also including the test prep that you did? Right. So uh, first we're talking about my test prep journey. I did take the SAT, although the SAT isn't required for an UC application. Mm -hmm. I had given three attempts to the SAT. 
and it was a journey because uh, the SAT is a tough exam. I got the required score which I wanted after my third attempt. So, uh, balancing was a thing for me. Honestly, I was I navigated the process more focused on my extracurriculars and my academics on the side. Although I recommend your academics being your way through the door. I think um, if you plan your academics in the fact that these are the three, four months which I want to study and I will uh, study for those exams, the rest of the months just uh, just uh, uh, spend on your extracurriculars and it's it's just simple time planning. I mean, you uh, your extracurriculars, if your extracurriculars are the things like if you play football or if you are part of like your robotic society, plan that after your uh, exams. Uh, plan that after there are always gaps in uh, your timeline where you can plan it and uh, balancing uh, I mean advice for balancing academics with extracurricular I, I mean once you just start studying and you start uh, really enjoying the subjects you take I mean I started enjoying my subjects in 11 12 when I took political science when I took economics and the subjects which I actually like once you start enjoying your subjects it's not more of a task it's not more of that you're studying for your exams it's that you're studying what you love so it does it becomes an extracurricular in itself that you're actually researching so uh i had a political science project in high school which were um, which was marked for my board exams it was uh, on abortion rights and basically after the it was before i the abortion decision came out what i did was i wrote a research paper on that so my extracurriculars basically complemented my academics I went a step further into studying and that didn't make the subject boring for me. So the subject was an interesting part. So that's why I think if you make the subject interesting and if you choose what you love, academics becomes an easy journey. All right. All right. That's a really good advice to hook on. And uh, yeah. So moving on to our next question. How do you believe your diverse extracurricular experiences will contribute to your college journey and your sleep? Yeah, I, I think uh, Berkeley is a big campus. It's a public school. Mm -hmm. So uh, considering I have experience in different religions and I also have an experience of a cultural background, mm -hmm. uh, it'll help me make friends with anyone and everyone. I mean, uh, I've made uh, through when I did Yale's summer school and uh, when I did other programs, I had met a lot of students from outside. I had, when I traveled, so I traveled to Jerusalem to just uh, work on my uh, project to work on uh, building an interfaith project. So interacting with different people and tell, uh, asking them about their experience is something which uh, is something which I've always been interested in. So socializing in Berkeley will be fun considering the diverse environment there and like the amount of students there because it's a big public school. All right. So uh, you received a license from government of India to fly drones. And that's another achievement that is very, you know, amazing to have. And not everybody could do that. And you did that uh, being underage, you know, and <laughs> it's an achievement in itself. So could you walk us through the entire journey? How did you get into the, um, the idea of flying drones and, you know, getting a license for it? Yeah, uh, I think this stems from the fact that my grandfather was a pilot. So uh, yeah. my grandfather and I had a very deep relationship. He also helped me with my political journey. But uh, because he was a pilot, I always, he always used to bring those gifts. Like as a child, you get a lot of gifts and I got a drone. And although uh, like the drones, you the toy drones, which you get are fun to use, you, uh, I wanted to use it for pr proper photography to uh, like uh, capture the trail of Nirvana. So like the paths Buddha traveled. So I wanted proper photography of like the Sanchi Stupa the, uh, or the Bodhi tree. So then that's where I started researching on what uh, organizations offer drone certification. And in India, drone certification is really hard to get considering that how in Delhi it's banned because of the volatile, uh, volatility of the people living uh, in Delhi. Uh, so I reached out to the Indian Institute of Drones where I was 16 year old, uh, when I was 16 year old and you get a license after you're uh, 17 and you're, you've passed the 10th grade. You have to show a 10th grade pass certificate to get a license for that. But I uh, wrote cold mails for a month or two and they finally accepted the fact that I can join their course. So I did training with them for two months uh, in drone flying. We had flown drones across hills. We had flown military-grade drones also. 
and once i had completed that they didn't give me my they didn't give me my a uh, certification immediately because i wasn't tenfold boss and uh, it was a wait, it was a wait of like 2 years and when i finally got my 10th certificate after covid uh, i was so excited because now uh, then i had i was legally able to fly drones in india and i mean this just stems because drone flying you wouldn't uh, see a person who's interested in economics or like who's like a football player uh, go specifically into drone flying because it's a tech field right but it uh, uh, it it was just a small interest stemmed out of the fact that i like toys uh, which <laughs> like fly and like i like the ai aspect of it and the photography aspect of it and i pursued it further and uh, because i pursued it further and i took the initiative of writing code mails to the indian institute of drones i got certified in it amazing we'll like to see some footage some day <laughs> that you've done yes, to the sure. drone flying all right so uh, you also extensively worked with ngos to the point where you helped some of the ngos build from the scratch so uh, can you share more about the opportunity that came with the projects and how did it happen for you all right uh, my my father was uh, when uh, when i was a child my father used to take me to ngos just to like um, basically do my service and as an extra part of their organizations mm-hmm. but what i really found is that i was interested in social service and social service was one big thing for me so i re- uh, so a few ngos i got uh, associated with at early was the navjyoti india foundation which is by dr kirk kiran bedi mm-hmm. uh, so i i had started working there with the students like talking to the students on a daily basis and by the time i reached in the 8th grade i realized that there is a big lack in the mental health frame uh, framework of uh, students uh, of the basic schooling system and that's when the indian government had just released the happiness program so uh, my work with ngos was building uh, a mental health curriculum for them and basically expanding their uh, base of students which they had so with navjyoti i built a mental health curriculum helping students basically uh, navigate uh, how you want to go uh, you want to apply uh, to colleges and do they actually want to get into colleges these are underprivileged children we are talking about and how they think about school how they think about peer pressure and that some of their students some of these students were part of the uh, right to education program so how they think about that them being in st- uh, schools where students are of much of a higher background or a higher economical background i think there was a lack of it so that's where i helped it with other foundations uh, such as the aicpd foundation which is a mobile innovation ban i helped a uh, crowd fund a lot of money so i had had 2 lakhs crowd funding for them and uh, basically uh, what they do is they build mobile vans uh, which offer schooling systems to urban migrant children and because of the urban migrant problem being so eminent after the covid pandemic um this this schooling was impact, uh, important so i had gone there personally with my team this was an extension of my bodhi trail initiative mm-hmm. i had gone there with my team where we helped them educate them on interfaith harmony educate them on mental health and basically like if if you reach out to ngos the founders want to work with you and once you uh, they are they want people to help them and that's it you just have to connect them to the right people i did a lot of corporate connecting for all uh, these ngos connecting them to the right corporates who will offer because corporates do want to do social work they just don't know which yeah. ngo to pick up so yeah. that's where i offered for the navjyoti foundation for aicpd and uh, some other ngos all right all right quite uh, task that must have been mm-hmm. right so apart from this coming on to your next extra curricular that you also launched the podcast on mental health so how was that and what thought provoked the idea of having a podcast to help the mental health of uh, students and you know people who are just listening to podcasts in general how how did that go and yeah i think it started with a uh... my journey uh, of realizing that my mental health wasn't the best in the start uh, so buddhism had helped me so i wanted to help other students and basically realize that there is a problem mm-hmm. and uh, a couple of my friends and uh, people who i worked with we basically started a podcast to 
during the pandemic most importantly we had a covid talk section where we during the pandemic we uh, talked about uh, mental health issues and the importance of how boards now being online is very important and i think just talking to each other and uh, maybe listening to that that there are other people who also struggle from the same issues is that it just makes it easier like uh, listening to a friend talk it's the same thing as you if you're talking to a friend and listening to the friend talk about the same problems you have it makes your problems easier and makes your struggle easier being not the only one left out in that and that's what we wanted to have like a more of a conversation podcast mm-hmm. so we had a lot of conversations through on different topics mental health food and importantly gymming and uh, that re- really resonated with a lot of people so we had a, a big traction on our podcast because of how casual we were in the talk and how we didn't we weren't giving people advice like psychiatrists but we were telling them that you're not alone in this struggle and we also had professionals come and talk on it because we didn't want to give out free solicited mental health uh, advice so they came and talked about how it's there it can be smaller maybe it's not that big of a problem and maybe there are smaller tips you can employ to better your mental health all right um another amazing achievement you did there <laughs> okay how do you plan to continue your involvement in the initiatives such as politics and uh, international affairs and then your podcast and then what else did you do debating and okay i'm out of words now <laughs> you you take it over so politics and economics uh, are honestly is what I'm going to be studying uh, college debating scene and engineering scene is big so i'm going to get into it berkeley has a big uh, debating team and we have a lot of rivals across top schools in the us so i want to get into it i want to be part of the debate society i reached out to a few members already um considering my initiatives and my social work and my work with the ngos i found uh, so what i wanted to do is find students who are actually want to do this uh in high school students and basically make it a passing on system so i found those students who can help me expand it further so even though if i'm in the us these guys can help expand it in india and i don't want to leave my connect like i always want to offer something in my community that's why like with my mental health curriculum i'm always expanding it to help more schools and um I mean, um, look, everything else with like football. I'm looking forward to playing to club football in, uh, in college, and looking forward to being like a, a, a fan of football, like American football in college. Like looking forward to the big game at uh, between Berkeley and Stanford. So there is a lot of things which I look forward to, and uh, there's a lot of things which I'll continue. Both the trail will always continue as a social. Uh, there will always be religious institutions which want help. and my connection with the dalai lama especially i mean i always reach out to them they whenever they ask me uh, i always try to reach out to them remotely online so i'm there uh, i'm just keeping it right now i'm focusing on get now focusing on my courses which i have in college but it's always there in the back of my mind all right amazing so okay it's a very heavy podcast so moving on to our last question finally uh what advice would you give to the students who are currently in the same journey and maybe uh looking for some kind of advice with their extra curriculars right i think my biggest advice for someone looking to expand their extra curriculars is don't build extra curriculars by what every one else is doing and what gets you into college but build extra curriculars on your personality and what you like to do like so if you're a kid who as a child like to do coding build your extra curriculars on that don't look at for example x student did this and that's why he got into stanford i mean that that's not what you should look at you should look at that what how my profile how can i expand my profile into finding initiatives that uh, that are in my path so like if i'm a tech student this is what i want to do this is what well, how can i make it one better like so for example if someone is if you if someone is already done like a uh, interfaith conference why not make it bigger maybe reach out to more people reach out have a bigger impact it's always about one upping uh, making it better and making it bigger and honestly with your extra curriculars just do as much as you can like keep keep a same th- uh, story keep a same theme to your profile but do as much as you can in as much time as you have left if you were in the 12th grade try focusing more on your academic part and 
keep your extracurriculars on the side but if you're in the ninth grade you have a lot of time i mean it's your extracurriculars just experience and you don't need to know what you want to do in college like i know what i want to do law but you don't need to know what you want to do in college maybe you can go undecided into a college it's the profile is built on what your personality is colleges look for diverse students the uh, if you make a basic profile and if you do things which are which everyone has done it doesn't differentiate you like in nobody in my school did a religious uh, profile in my grade and i think that's what differentiated me to get into college uh, and i think just find your thing find your passion all right so that was a very experience and you know information for a podcast a heavy podcast i understand but thank you so much riyan for all the information that you gave and all the things that you've been doing it's amazing it's so commendable it was great having you here it was my pleasure being here thank you so much yeah so with this we leave you on podcast today and i hope you like the podcast if you did don't forget to like share and subscribe to the channel and if you're listening this on spotify don't forget to give us five star and share it further with your friends and family to help them educate about extra curriculars and okay with this i bid you goodbye bye bye